Yeah, yeah. So I was saying, yeah, so what happens when majority fails? And the reason that the majority would fail in uh, ledgers would be, for example, if uh, the, the system is young, it hasn't matured yet and not enough hashing power secures it, then it would be easier for an attacker to buy uh, some hashing power and attack it. And when the majority, honest majority fails, uh, what happens is uh, uh, all sorts of attacks. So the most uh, common one is uh, double spending, and this, has, uh, this attack has been observed in a wide range of systems. Uh, and, but also there, is, there are attacks against liveness, and these are, these are actually more sinister because they are harder to uh, identify, and they can uh, uh, hurt specific um, uh, uh, companies or users, for example, by sensor transactions. So the question is, when OS majority fails, what can we, can we do? And more importantly, more importantly, what can we do such that the ledger maintenance is not trivialized? So that we still use a ledger and the, the miner's job does not become redundant. So this will be the topic of my presentation. And as an overview, first of all, I'm gonna present the, our idea of how to do it. And this is kind of an old idea in the, in the space. And then I'm gonna describe how these, uh, these checkpoints are idea and for, uh, ensures that uh, liveness and persistence, the two needed properties of a ledger, are guaranteed, uh, even if the adversary has a majority. And then I'm gonna describe you how we implement, we can implement this checkpointing. And finally, how we can implement checkpointing in a completely decentralized way so that we don't have to rely on a small set of parties to secure the ledger. Okay, so as I said, the goal is to secure a ledger, assuming that an adversary might have 51% uh, of the mining power or more. And also to, to do this while re, uh, retaining the usage of the, of the ledger itself. So assuming that a minimal amount of uh, the computation is outsourced somewhere else. Uh, so the core idea is to shift the security assumption from the ledger itself, from the, the honest, uh, from the mining power, to an external set of parties. And these parties can guarantee the security of the ledger. And obviously, in this set of parties, we have to assume that, well, the, the operation that they, that they do is secure. So what we will show, what we will need, as we proceed, is that this set of parties has an honest majority itself. So let me go through the, the preliminaries. So first of all, we assume a, a number of parties, like many uh, existing uh, formalizations of, uh, uh, of blockchains. We assume a round-based execution. At the end of each round, all messages are delivered. So we, we have a synchronous setting. And also the block size is unlimited, which, well, it might seem counterintuitive, but it helps us uh, make some of the proofs easier. And also it can be, in the real world, it can be simulated by assuming, for example, that the network is not congested. Then uh, in terms of the, the proof of work, each party has Q queries to the random oracle. So that means that uh, this is their hashing power. And each query is successful with probability P. So with probability P, each query, uh, a query will produce a block, will result in a valid block. And the adversary controls T of these parties and uh, also it is adaptive and rational. Okay, so let's see the ledger properties I want to secure. So uh, the, the, there are two ledger properties that we want to ensure. The first is persistence, which means that uh, up to some point, the chain that every honest party uh, has is the same. That means that if we remove the latest key blocks, the, the rest of the chain is the same for all honest parties. And the other is liveness, uh, which means that a transaction will eventually be put on the blockchain after some parameter uh, of time. So what does checkpointing do? So as I said, this is an external functionality which helps uh, secure the ledger. And this functionality uh, should do the minimal work. So the work that it does is that it follows the consensus rules. So it adopts the longest chain that this is on, on the network. But every KC blocks, it checks point, it checkpoints it. It practically time, uh, stamps it, and the checkpoint can never be reverted. 
So the honest parties will never drop uh, a checkpoint. And importantly, uh, the, the functionality also picks a random value. So this random value will help to prevent against the block lead attack, which I will explain later, uh, but which is an attack that targets, that actually can break uh, liveness for every checkpointing system that well, exists out there. Uh, and also in our functionality, we give the adversary some power to, to affect this randomness. So we assume, we want to model that, that the adversary has some kind of power within this authority that runs checkpointing. So it might corrupt some parts of the authority, but not a majority of it. Okay, so after having the functionality, we want to prove the two, two properties. And first is persistence, which is kind of obvious. So if uh, we cut uh, enough blocks from the end of the, of the chain, one of these will be a checkpoint. And since an honest party will never re revert a checkpoint, well, everything before all the parties will have the same chain before that. So persistence comes kind of uh, easily from the checkpointing. And actually this is the property that most checkpointing uh, systems uh, that exist right now out there uh, try to persist. And uh, well, the way that they do it typically is that they checkpoint an a, a node block. So they find a block that is deeply buried into the chain, and they just time stamp it or they, they stamp it. For example, they, they publish it on the, on the source code of the client. The second property is, is trickier. So here we have liveness. And the reason that it's trickier is because, as I mentioned, the, the adversary has, might have more power than the honest parties. So the adversary might be able to produce more blocks than the, uh, the, uh, the honest parties on average. And what we want to do is we, we want to try to restrict this advantage of the adversary such that at least one of the honest blocks will become part of the chain, of the checkpoint chain. So the, the way that we argue about liveness is that we say, first of all, if an honest block gets checkpointed after a transaction is created, then uh, this transaction will become stable. And the reason is that, let's say that I create a transaction and I disperse it on the, uh, diffuse it on the network. Uh, then if an honest min a miner acquires this transaction, they will try to put it in a block. So even if the adversary does not, the honest miners will. And if an honest block that comes after the transaction is checkpointed, then by definition, either this block or the chain that it extends will contain the transaction. So it, in our analysis, it is enough to show that after some time, at least one, one honest block will become checkpointed. So uh, what we assume is that, first of all, the adversary cannot censor honest blocks. So if, a, if an honest party creates a block, every other party will get it by the end of the round. Then uh, we assume that the adversary will mine uh, separately from the honest parties. And the reason that this is a valid assumption is because if the adversary uh, adopts one block, one honest block that is produced after the transaction is created, as I described, this block will contain the transaction under question. So that if the adversary wants to break liveness for a, spe a specific transaction, it should not adopt any of the honest part, uh, blocks that are created. And the way that we model our execution is via a Markov chain. Uh, so we have an absorbing Markov chain starting from uh, both uh, the adversary and the honest parties have the same chain. They proceed uh, by creating blocks with some probability. And the probability depends on the adversary power and the honest mining power. And the, absor uh, the absorbing state uh, is, occurs or describes uh, what happens when an honest party is checkpointed. And it's absorbing because after an honest block is checkpointed, well, the adversary can never drop it and the transaction is, uh, is stable. So liveness has been preserved. So what we want to show is that eventually uh, the, uh, the mark chain will reach the absorption uh, state. And as I will show you, the, this probability, the number of steps 
or the time until absorption depends obviously on the power of the adversary, but also on how frequently we checkpoint the chain. Uh, so as the adversary power uh, increases, that the probability for absorption decreases. Also, as the checkpointing becomes uh, rarer, again, the probability decreases. But as we, the execution routes increase, as more time goes by, the probability will tend to and this is an example of, a, of, a, of such a Markov chain. So this is the Markov chain that describes the case for every block. So whenever it extends a chain, the authority checkpoints it. So beginning, for example, from uh, the state 1-1, one, one, and 1-1 one, one here means that both the honest parties and the adversary in one block to sort of reach the next checkpoint. Uh, the adversary goes the, the execution goes to, to state one comma zero if the adversary creates a block and note that if the adversary creates a block then the adversary has practically quote unquote won, uh, won this uh, checkpoint so the execution goes to 1.0 and then when the honest parties also create a block the adversary can now compete with this honest block and because it is uh it is rushing the adversarial block will be adopted and we go back to 1.1 but if the honest parties create a block and the adversary doesn't, then the adversary cannot compete with this block and this block will be checkpointed. And since it is an honest block, we go to the absorption state. And this is uh, where the execution of the Markov chain practically ends because we have liveness. So what we did next is uh, we evaluated this analysis, this liveness analysis on Ethereum Classic, which is a, well, it is, it is a system that suffered a 51% attack. And expectedly, what we, we found was that uh, if, for example, we fix the adversary to 50% plus one power, then as the interval between checkpoints increases, the probability that we have liveness after some time decreases. So as you can see here, if we checkpoint every block, then practically after almost uh, well, a minute or rather 10 minutes, we have uh, liveness with probability one. But if, for example, we checkpoint every 10 blocks, then this probability drops. And as uh, the, the interval increases, it drops significantly. The other interesting uh, metric is the, accept the, ex the expected number of steps before absorption, which means how much time, on average, we, we need in, until a transaction uh, is, is say, stable. And as we see here, if the adversary is below 50%, then uh, this number of steps increase linearly, which makes sense because the adversary is in the, mi the minority. But if the adversary has a majority, then the number of steps increases exponentially to the interval between checkpoints. And if, for example, the adversary has two thirds, a super majority, then this increase, well, we need, it, it's, it's an, on a completely uh, another, it's an, another scale. And that's why I had actually to use a different axis here to show that. Okay, so uh, we have analyzed uh, uh, our uh, checkpointing for persistence and liveness. And an interesting uh, attack that kind of emerged during our analysis was block lead. So imagine that we have a chain and uh, it's the white chain that you see here. And uh, at some point, the, the honest parties and the attacker start trying to win the next checkpoint. So the honest parties are below, the attacker is above. The black blocks are the two blocks that the adversary has managed to, to mine. So the adversary has sort of, quote unquote, won this, this uh, checkpoint. But then the adversary continues mining more blocks. So the adversary mines blocks into the next uh, checkpoint period. And because the adversary might have a majority, uh, this, uh, this advantage will only increase. So the adversary will build more and more blocks into the future. And if we don't put a limit to, to this advantage of the adversary, then it will be impossible to guarantee liveness because the adversary will always have more blocks to compete with the honest blocks. And this is the reason why existing check, uh, checkpoint systems typically don't uh, have test 
Uh, and the, the way that we counter blocking is that we refresh the execution with a checkpoint. So the authority that issues the checkpoints acts as a randomness beacon, and this randomness is unpredictable by the adversary. So the adversary can only build it, its advantage within the uh, checkpoint period uh, of execution. We cannot grow into the future. All right, so after analyzing our uh, well, we implement and uh, we where we is by realizing the checkpoint fee as well among some parties. And the parties act in the same way like nationality, so they adopt the, the longest chain and every case it blocks, they checkpoint it. And the way they checkpoint it is that they, each party picks random nodes and then they run a, either a failed stop or a Byzantine agreement protocol to agree on which checkpoint and which random nodes to uh, produce, to, to output. After uh, assuming that the, the protocol, the subroutine, uh, agreement subroutine finishes correctly, then we have a checkpoint. Uh, and now the miners, when they mine as under the, in this uh, checkpoint setting, they, all, they prioritize checkpoints over the longest chain. So they might, uh, for example, the longest if it forks in a block before the latest checkpoint. And there is uh, uh, this uh, protocol. And the reason that we, the implementation is interesting is because, as you see, the, the, the protocol the checkpointing now is, uh, has to be very active. It has to checkpoint very regularly on the chain. So it has to be efficient. So the way that we implement our prototype is by we run some simulations on uh, uh, Amazon. And we assume that uh, the authority checkpoints every four blocks. And we had 15 uh, nodes that coordinate in order to produce these checkpoints. And what we saw was that uh, in terms of storage, so in terms of the overhead of the checkpoints in the, the ledger, uh, we are pretty okay. So we had, we had the 0.6 increase in the ledger size. And this increase is practically the length of the signatures of the, the checkpointing parties for the chain. So, Obviously, uh, what, what we did here was the naive approach, which where every party signs a block and we just concatenate the signatures. If we, use, we could also use some other DA signatures to make this more efficient and the signatures shorter. The, the interesting metric though is latency, which means, which is the time between retrieving a block and issuing the checkpoint. Uh, so on average, this uh, latency was uh, sub uh, one second, so about 600 milliseconds, with a maximum of 1.5 seconds. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the more widespread geographically the nodes were, the larger the latency. So uh, if we are in the UK and we connect to a node in Singapore, then we had about eight, seven, 100, 800 milliseconds of latency. But uh, assuming that uh, the, the period between the blocks of the ledger is long enough, so even if, for example, we consider Ethereum where a block is issued every 12 or 13 seconds, uh, sub one second uh, latency could be deemed acceptable in our case. Okay, so we have constructed checkpoints. We have shown that they secure the ledger uh, how can we make this as decentralized as possible? And the way that we do it is via timestamping. So timestamping uh, is works as such. So let's say uh, assume we have this graph of, of blocks, and starting from A, we want to, which is the common ancestor, we want to to decide which uh, path, which uh, branch to adopt. Let's say uh, we're the miner. So the way that time summing works is that in every fork, we adopt the block with the oldest timestamp, which means that it is a block that was first produced. So as you see here, uh, block D has a, has a newer timestamp compared to block C. Uh, and also 
compare, uh, log e has a, a nearest time sum. So a, b, c is the branch that we, that we adopt. A block hole might also not be time stamped, but this obviously raises a lot of problems because a non time stamped block is, well, can be discarded by a time stamped block. Uh, and uh, the way that time stamping works is that we time stamp every block. So the miners, the moment that they create a block, they send it to a time stamping authority, and the authority just puts the, a, an increasing counter on the block. And uh, it is important to timestamp as quickly as possible because obviously a competing miner or the adversary uh, might uh, beat the, the party to uh, the timestamp and timestamp the block first. Uh, the interesting thing here is that the timestamp uh, the time stamp doesn't need to apply on the whole block, but just the block header. But also importantly, uh, it's not enough to timestamp a hash of the block, but we need to timestamp the the, the entire block header, because otherwise the adversary could just keep the block itself secret. And the way that we decentralize the time summing authority is by using a ledger to as the time summing service. So what uh, we, this is kind of obviously basically done by publishing the block header on a ledger, and the position of the of the transaction that publishes the block header on the ledger is a timestamp of well, the, the block. And we evaluated uh, this decentralized time stamping on Ethereum and Bitcoin. And uh, well, as expected, in terms of latency, uh, it is worse. And uh, it practically depends on the other line, on, on the time stamping ledger's uh, performance. So in Bitcoin, we have a block every 10 minutes. So optimistically, we have a timestamp every 10 minutes. Uh, if we want this timestamp to be stable, we have to wait for an hour. Uh, in terms of cost, also, uh, if, uh, it is more costly than well, running just a free central uh, federated checkpointing service. But in this case, Ethereum is uh, clearly cheaper than uh, Bitcoin. And the other uh, metric is the proof size. So if a miner wants to verify a timestamp, they need to somehow uh, verify its position in the ledger. And uh, uh, well, the, the naive way run a full, which assumes that you don't have the whole chain, but there are also light client approaches like SPV, MIPA Pause, flight clients, and uh, a whole uh, lot of research that has been done on this uh, domain. So yeah, in conclusion, this was uh, our work. And uh, yeah, just the, the, three, the three key points to take out of the presentation is that if the, adver uh, the adversary uh, has a majority, the only thing that we can do to protect the ledger is to introduce an external set of parties to shift the, the security assumption. Uh, the checkpoints need to be part of the chain because otherwise we have the block lead attack. And also checkpoints can be fully decentralized using this time stamping uh, distributed ledger method that I described. Thank you very much.